hey hey what's up guys in this video i would like to talk to you about one of the most interesting philosophers ever whose name was arthur schopenhauer well he is uh, not as famous as uh, these other sort of superstars of philosophy i mean he's not as famous as nietzsche plato hegel marx but he was very very influential okay you might be surprised that uh, pretty much all of nietzsche's philosophy derives from schopenhauer's philosophy uh, freud got most of his uh, psychoanalytic ideas from schopenhauer uh, charles darwin was influenced by schopenhauer einstein was very influenced by schopenhauer leo tolstoy the russian novelist who wrote uh, war and peace uh, which was uh, named uh, to be the greatest uh, novel ever written by the times magazine he was very very influenced by schopenhauer wagner the great one of the greatest uh, german composers i mean i know he is extremely controversial but he's a terrific composer he was very very influenced by schopenhauer most of his operas have uh, schopenhauerian motifs in them ludwig wittgenstein was very influenced by arthur schopenhauer so who is this guy uh, who is this philosopher arthur schopenhauer he was a german idealist he lived uh, in germany approximately 200 years ago at the same time as hegel and he was trying to compete with hegel they were both uh, teaching in the same university university of berlin and of course hegel got all the you know good stuff he got the respect he, he had all the students coming to his lectures and schopenhauer tried to compete with him he would have his class at the same time as hegel's class and no one would come to his class and he just uh, taught for a little bit i think it was just like a year or two and he just gave up and he despised hegel and uh, if you read his main work his masterpiece um, the world as will and representation also known as the world as will and idea you will see that he really makes fun of hegel like every second page he pokes fun at him like he's he says well this idea you know i am bringing up it's perhaps crazy it's perhaps complicated but it's not as crazy as the stupid nonsense hegel was talking about so he really really uh bad mouth is hegel at every chance he gets well what about his actual philosophy all right schopenhauer is the most pessimistic philosopher in western tradition okay there is no doubt like he is crushingly pessimistic um whatever positive ideas you know like love progress um civilization hope he destroys all of these concepts he shows them to be illusions uh deceptions uh they're not really um they're not a big deal for schopenhauer because at the end uh we are just creatures driven by something he calls the will and you know that's kind of a bad term uh, perhaps a better term would be energy and that's why we suffer okay so that's the nutshell of his philosophy and i know at this point it probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense so let's start at the beginning with his philosophy so to get started with schopenhauer you need to know some kant emmanuel kant and we are adults okay i'm not talking about kant now k-a-n-t the greatest uh, german philosopher ever probably i think Immanuel Kant's Critique of Pure Reason is where Schopenhauer um, got the foundation for his philosophy. And essentially, Kant's Critique of Pure Reason says that time and space do not exist out there objectively. They are 
preconditions of human experience. They have a subjective component. Like, and I know it's a very, very complicated idea, but in a nutshell, it states that everything that takes place in space and time is an appearance. Okay, like you cannot talk about the world apart from space and time. Like, let me, you know, ask you a question. Well, can you, let's say, think this cell phone out of space? All right, so bam. See, like, we have empty space, but there is no object there. But let me ask this, you know, question vice versa. You know, now imagine the cell phone without space. So you can imagine space without objects, but you cannot imagine objects without space. And uh, I'll make a separate video on Kant's um, complicated philosophy and on his critique of pure reason especially, but that's uh, what he says about space. So space is a precondition of outer experience. So whatever takes place outside of your head, outside of your subjective world, takes place in space. And space is a priori. And same thing with uh, time. So what is time? Time is the way our brain organizes inner experience. So, you know, your thoughts, your feelings, your memories, they are organized in time. That's what time is. It's simply a form of inner perception, form of inner intuition. And space is a form of outer intuition. So, and space and time give you essentially everything that is causal. Okay, so anything. Um, so also the law of causality is also subjective. So anything that takes place in space and in time is causally forms a chain of causes. And uh, watch my Kant video to kind of clarify this. And but don't you know stress about it too much. So essentially, that is what the world as appearance is. The world as it appears to us in space and in time, and as it is causally conditioned. So anything that takes place in space and in time is given to us as an idea. All right. And for Kant, uh, that's as far as you can get. OK, so the world as an appearance, the world which we can think about in space and in time, that's pretty much um, all we can know. That's the limit of human knowledge for Kant. And you might ask a question, well, what about uh, sort of the world if space and time are subjective, well, what if we think it away? Okay, what if we kind of ask the question, what is the world like in itself? And Kant says, we do not know, right? All we know is appearances. And the world as it is in itself, Kant calls the thing in itself. And for him, you cannot go past it. You cannot go beyond it. And Schopenhauer says, hmm, well, yeah, like it's kind of a limit, but there is one object in this world which we can, in some sense, know in a different way. And what is it? Well, it's our body, okay? Like you see our body, it's a thing that exists in space and in time and it's an appearance okay like i mean it's like here's my hand it's you know here's the cell phone both occupy space both occupy time but you see uh, the way you experience your body there is this kind of extra vague dimension to it you know your body from the inside too um, and, of course, um, things get really vague once we talk about our inner world, like our body world. It's like things get vague. Like, I mean, um, appearances are clear, okay? Like, that's an object, you know, that's an object. It takes um, this much 
space it takes this much time but uh, when we think about our inner world like things kind of get dark and vague and uh, that's where freud got his uh, you know a lot of his ideas about the subconscious uh, for instance if you read his uh, masterpiece interpretation of dreams which i have on my bookshelf right now um, he talks about Schopenhauer at the beginning uh, and Freud's uh, uh, dream interpretation concepts. A lot of them got derived from Schopenhauer. But anyways, I'll make a separate video on Freud later on. Um, and uh, this inner, what can we know about this vague inner world which we have? Well, we can know one thing for sure is that it kind of drives us okay there is all these desires which never ever stop i mean we get hungry we get thirsty we get ambitious we get sexual instincts uh, sexual desire we have kind of all these desires um and they never ever end okay like from the moment we are born our whole life is just desire okay and schopenhauer says well that's the thing in itself like literally that's um the world as will okay it's accessible to us through our experience of our body okay that's will and that's the world as a thing in itself so the whole world um if you want to make sense of the whole world outside of space and time which can't sort of uh, outlined in his critique of pure reason the the key to it the key to this incredible door of the world as well is located inside your body okay that's how you access it and based on that we make uh incredible incredible conclusions okay this um world as well which um schopenhauer talks about it is really uh, outside of space and time. And it's kind of uh, curious, um, you know, if you like really, it, it definitely takes a lot of thought to kind of wrap your mind about these abstract concepts and uh, feel free to, you know, just pause this video and get back to it, you know, later on, um, you know, that's fine. Um, it took me like, you know, like a year to make sense of this stuff at least. Um, so let us talk about the world as will, the world as will. We have these cravings, we have these desires and every other living thing also has these, uh, forces and desires. And of course you kind of might you know bring up an objection which is which is a really good objection well like isn't it kind of um you know introducing some kind of you know magic into uh you know philosophy like you know saying that like my desire that's how the whole world is and i understand it's kind of silly but not really that's and, and this is really interesting schopenhauer says well let's look at a concept of force okay concept of force like which um i mean he lived before einstein he lived before quantum mechanics um he lived in the uh, 18th and 19th centuries uh, i mean the science which was known to him was newtonian science and uh, of course newton uh, you know gave us all these uh you know forces he was talking about uh, sort of forces okay vectors like you know here is like a car at this point moving towards here you know just forces um and a lot of you probably you know if you had physics in high schools like these forces you used to draw you know using formulas you know such as f equals ma you know to calculate you know mass or acceleration um that's what um schopenhauer gives as an example okay so let's look at a force like for instance an electrical force like we have a magnet and it pulls a piece of metal towards it okay well what's happening um you see 
uh, it's kind of interesting that you can never ever know what's actually happening there and schopenhauer says well that's will that's this thing in itself which can never be known and to this day you know physicists you know they can tell you how the magnetic force functions you know they give you all these formulas you know and i studied them you know in university for quite a while i mean it's pretty hard stuff you know but they can you know give you an equation which says well you know magnetic force you know pulls any object which comes within the magnetic uh, field with this much force you know that's the how fast it will move how you know different conditions um, but it can never tell you what is actually this electric force like it's like you can see how it acts but you cannot know all there is to it like you cannot know it as a thing in itself <laughs> same thing with us uh, so this is the lowest um, level of our knowledge of the world as will forces of nature and moving up it kind of becomes more complicated i mean this you know example with a magnet it was pretty simple but um then we move up to plants okay to plant uh, kingdom and uh things become not as clear like um in the case of you know inorganic nature you know like the magnet example i have uh, just outlined um it, it's you know cause and effect is pretty straightforward you know you just have an equation you can calculate now what about vegetative life you know plants um well things are not as clear like for if you have a plant you know in your room okay do you i do it's uh, really good for you i think so when you water it it's really hard to predict how much water will result in how much plant growth okay it's sort of cause and effect becomes more complicated okay but it's uh still the same principle applies like we do not know the force which drives the plant to grow okay and of course schopenhauer would say it's the the will okay it's this energy of striving of this this thing in itself will okay um and then we move up to us humans okay and with us uh, things become really really unpredictable but schopenhauer says that you as a thing occupying space and time are 100 percent causally determined okay <laughs> you do not have free will um as a phenomenon well i uh just i'll clarify this in a uh, other video about this kind of his complicated view of causes so that's uh schopenhauer's uh idea in a nutshell okay so we know the world as representation and we know it as will and this will is the reason why we suffer so much okay because uh, we just cannot satisfy all of our desires like the higher up you move in um, hierarchy of life the more pleasure becomes accessible to you but at the same time more suffering becomes accessible to you so animals do not suffer as much as we humans do okay they do not have the same pleasures as we do you know like for instance uh, a squirrel cannot you know read plato and enjoy it as much as you can but at the same time you know a squirrel does not have to you know suffer a broken heart it does not have to uh, suffer disappointment and you know animals don't even know that they will die like we do and you know kind of we usually push it aside you know kind of try not to think about it but we know it will happen and all these you know thoughts and anxieties um it's part of our human condition so another thing uh, that's schopenhauer uh which is a big part of his philosophy is well how do you deal with this suffering well can you do anything about it and you know like i said he's a crushing pessimist and he you know his answer is no however 
you may temporarily tame your will. And there are kind of several cures he gives. Um, so one is music. Okay, it's kind of interesting. Uh, Schopenhauer says that music is the form of art which is closest to the will. And, you know, kind of think about it, you know, music is the least spatio-temporally caused art, okay? Like sculpture, you know, like let's say look at sculpture. I mean, um, it takes place, you know, you have this, I don't know, Michelangelo, Michelangelo's David, you know, it occupies some space, it occupies some time, you know, and then you have more abstract art, you know, so art, arts have a hierarchy, you know, they go from kind of more physical to less physical. And the less physical the art is, the closer it is to will. Um, the closer it is to grasping this will, which makes us suffer. Um, and for Schopenhauer, it's music. And, you know, think about it. There, you know, music is not occupying space. It's not occupying time. It's just this, you know, incredible, uh, you know, vibration, you know, this kind of bunch of strings and keys, and they kind of unify to you know, speak to our, you know, deepest, deepest feelings. It's kind of incredible, you know, how, you know, think about different um, forms of art, you know, like poetry, sculpture, and like, I don't think anything has ever moved you as deeply as music has, okay? It's just, um, it's the form of art closest to the will. And, um, you know, when you listen to music, which you enjoy, you really, you uh, you really can <laughs> ease your suffering for a little bit. You know, you're heartbroken. You just listen to some, you know, love music and you cry your eyes out and you feel better. You know, you just, you know, different music, really different genres of music, different styles of music, uh, you know, really help you deal with different types of uh, lives, uh, sufferings okay so that's number one music um another one is compassion okay so when you feel compassion towards uh, someone else you it's kind of interesting you know what is compassion you know and uh, compassion is it's not feeling sorry okay it's not you know realizing oh you know like i feel sorry you know you you feel bad compassion is suffering with someone else and through this experience you know you kind of humble yourself and you suppress your will for a while that's what happens when you um, feel genuine compassion towards uh, somebody and uh, it's another one of his uh, kind of cures and uh, he has uh, like two more but um, you know we'll talk about it maybe in a different video <clears throat> That's uh, what um, Schopenhauer thought about suppressing the will. Now, what did he think about religions? Okay, well, he pretty much agreed with Kant that um, essentially Kant destroyed speculative theology. So all of these uh, proofs of God, you know, which you uh, maybe heard about, you know, like, you know, God, if everything has a cause, you know, you have a cause, you know, which are your parents, you know, they have a cause. Well, what was the first cause? Well, Kant in his Critique of Pure Reason uh, really, really delivered a death blow to all of these kinds of arguments. I mean, later philosophers tried to disagree with him, um, you know, Fichte, Schelling, and Hegel, and a whole bunch of other philosophers, but uh, Schopenhauer agreed with him that, um, you know, this deep metaphysical, theological, you know, religions, they're all mistaken. However, however, there is something, uh, you know, different religions uh, have this manifested to different degrees, but all religions have this kind of um, story about what's going to happen to you when you exist no more. And that's what Schopenhauer thought, you know, it just simply gives people um, hope, gives them, you know, kind of consolation, but he 
uh, did not really believe believe in God. And Nietzsche called him the first uh, actual atheist, like the first modern atheist. You know, like he wasn't uh, even considering God as a serious hypothesis. Uh, he was just, you know, thought it's just made up, you know, BS, and there is no need for it. You know, that's what he thought about religion. But, and so as far, and he was, a, of course, uh, a, you know, man who was brought up in, you know, Western Europe. So uh, he valued Catholicism above Protestantism. You know, he did not like Protestantism at all, but he did like some sort of... Uh, um, life denying tendencies in Catholicism, you know, like for instance, uh, you know, these, you know, fasts when you don't eat for a day, you know, you kind of suppress your desire for a while, um, you know, chastity, you know, cause you, you know, if you don't, um, engage in sexual intercourse, uh, you know, you don't engage in love life, uh, you just don't suffer as much. Uh, I mean, you know, think about how much you've suffered, uh, you know, because of the opposite sex or same sex, whatever the case may be. Um, and uh, that's, uh, and, and his favorite uh, Catholic writer was uh, Balthazar Gracian, this interesting uh, Jesuit uh, essayist and novelist. Uh, and Schopenhauer translated one of his novels into German. <clears throat> so, um, what about his uh, kind of personal interests? Well, he was pretty terrible at math. Uh, you know, he, you know, uh, Oswald Spengler, about whom I will make a video, you know, said that uh, Schopenhauer was just stupid when it came to mathematics. But, you know, um, he had pretty basic understanding of mathematics. He did not really get it. But, you know, he was an incredibly intelligent man otherwise, uh, as far as humanities are concerned. Uh, he knew like six languages, you know, German, English, Italian, Spanish, Latin, and Greek. Um, he was friends with uh, Johann Goethe, you know, who was extremely, extremely important uh, genius. And um, let me give you homework right now. Like if you do not know who Goethe is, G-O-E-T-H-E, -E, Goethe. He was the guy who wrote uh, Faust. You gotta know him, you know, like he's really, really important. They were good friends and uh, they kind of had a falling out. So Goethe, um, well, he was friends with Schopenhauer and he got, he was influenced by Schopenhauer too, to some extent, but, um, you know, they did not sort of get along perfectly, okay? But Goethe got, he got along pretty well with Hegel and that's why. You know, that's one of the reasons why Hegel got all this incredible fame and success was because of Goethe's help. And Goethe was this uh, superstar of uh, German intellectual life at, the, at that time. Um, that's Arthur Schopenhauer, pretty much. Now, he's a really, really interesting philosopher, you know, really interesting. So, um, if you liked... Uh, some of this stuff I was talking about, I really encourage you and challenge you to go read his main book, which is called The World as Will and Idea. It's uh, two volumes, pretty huge. Uh, you know, it's going to take you at least uh, a month. Like if you read every day for a couple of hours, it's going to take you like at least, you know, one or two months to get through it. And it's challenging, but the insights are just incredible. Sometimes it's just unbelievable how deep he goes and uh, how interesting it is and just so many things make sense um, that's the pessimistic Arthur Schopenhauer for you and uh, that's all I pretty much have to say as far as this uh, introductory video into his philosophy <laughs>